to climb up those steps and make your way in and then to arrive at the top of the steps and then look in and see the mezzanine filled with books and the bus. It's, it's inspiring. I love when we have visitors that come in for the first time. They walk in the front door and usually if it's someone that's new to the building, the first thing I hear is a giant <gasps> and then the next word out of their mouth is, oh my goodness, this is what a library should look like. And part of what I find um, sometimes overwhelming but totally gratifying is that uh, this institution has existed for hundreds of years and every day when I come into work I get to contribute to history. The Athenaeum is this wonderful unique library and cultural center in the historic section of Providence. Uh, we are one of about 17 membership libraries that still exist in the country today. And I'm actually proud to say uh, the Providence Athenaeum is one of two membership libraries that exist in Rhode Island. Um, we have a sister organization that actually predates us in Newport, and that's the Redwood Library in Athenaeum. The word Athenaeum comes from the Greek idea of learning, and it's so fitting that our architecture is based on the Greek Revival style where it's a temple of learning. But an Athenaeum was a place where um, people came to uh, converse and talk about their ideology, their theology, their learning, their science, exploration, um, and it was really a convening place for learning, and it still is today. We trace our history back to 1753 when the Providence Library Company formed uh, by the merchants and the men of the day uh, to form a library greater than any one individual could. And they did that in order to share resources. And at that time, the city was growing, and they wanted to make that information available to all. So the L Providence Library Company existed in many places throughout the city, often being at the, in the seat of town government. And they purchased their materials from England. Their original collection was about 345 titles. They unfortunately had a tragic event in the late 1700s where there was a fire on Christmas Eve and out of those 345 titles they had originally purchased, they lost many in that fire except for about 70 that were still in circulation. We actually have some of the, that founding collection. Uh, what's really interesting is that they had the foresight to make a notation so that they knew uh, they were uh, following the original founding collection and as it got back into the library. So if you see very closely up on the top, there's a little tiny pencil asterisk. So they made that notation in the original register and they also made it on the books because they were looking to, and we continue, um, to try to replace um, the original volumes um, as they become available. Um, so they were tracking them early on. Um, they went on and ended up uh, still uh, purchasing more books and being in different buildings throughout the city. Um, later in the 1800s there was another organization um, called the Providence Athenaeum that formed in 1831. In 1836 the Athenaeum in Providence was formed as a result of these two organizations and we ended up being in the arcade downtown for a couple of years while uh, this property was being built on the corner of College and Benefit. And then we moved in here in 1838 and we opened our doors onto what was the marketplace at that time. And uh, Francis Whalen, the former uh, president of Brown University, gave his discourse and he's standing out on the doors a wide open and uh, the crowd has gathered. He's talking about let us not labor for the east side, for the west side, for the south side, the north side, but for the city of Providence so that all may um, partake. And, uh, and so we've stayed true to that mission. 
The historical significance of this building is really quite profound. Uh, the building itself, the original building, was built in 1838. The architect was William Strickland, who um, was a young architect, uh, really uh, one of the early founders of the American Institute for Architects. And this is one of his only examples of Greek Revival architecture here in the city. The Athenaeum is special in many ways. I think it's special, obviously, from what you see visually. Uh, this is just an amazing space. I always refer to it as an inspired space. And while uh, the viewers cannot experience um, actually being the space other than visually, but there's just a, a real smell of old books and leather and um, I always liken it to frankincense and myrrh but it's just um, it's a very uh, very personal uh, space uh, and I think people come uh, for that sense of the building I think they come because there's a real sense of community um, we don't have library cards it's almost like Cheers, where everybody knows your name <laughs> when you walk into the building. We're not necessarily the quietest library either because the circulation desk is located right in the center of the space and uh, we're always seeing old friends as, as they come in. We actually predated the public library movement. When the Providence Library Company was formed, it was based on the Benjamin Franklin idea where the company, the founding fathers actually had a company and they bought shares and so they invest in that and then they use those pooled resources to purchase their books. The earlier organization, uh, the Providence Athenaeum, also had done a similar thing. So basically when we were organized, we were um, membership-based libraries and so the members of that organization purchased shares and then they made those available um, to their families and so forth. When the public library movement came into being, then of course they were using the resources from the community and there was public monies to support those libraries. Membership libraries are still supported by members and so we consider ourselves, coming from that tradition, an independent member-supported library open to the public. So that means all our funding, unlike the public library, basically comes from our own resources. We are fortunate that the people that started this institution years and years ago thought to steward it as well, and so we do have an endowment which we rely on. But most of our financial means come from uh, the members themselves, and they purchase the membership. So we're, while we're open to the public, people can come in, utilize the space, enjoy the space, come to programs, but if they want to actually borrow a book, uh, then they would purchase a membership fee. And that's really our financial model, along with um, much fundraising. We have just under a thousand members today. As far as the type of person that finds the Athenaeum, it's usually uh, someone that um, is intellectually curious, uh, is enthralled with history, uh, is probably a bibliophile and loves books, the smell of books, um, the feel of books, uh, someone that is culturally invested in the community and wants to be civically engaged, uh, someone that is looking for new experiences uh, through our programming. One of the reasons why tourists come through and visit the Athenaeum is they've heard these amazing stories about how Edgar Allan Poe courted Sarah Helen Whitman here. Sarah Helen Whitman was actually a, a poet herself and a writer and a prominent uh, woman here in Providence and she had become quite enamored by Mr. Poe, much to her family's dissatisfaction because Poe had somewhat of a reputation. But Sarah Helen Whitman would come here and use the Athenaeum and Edgar Allan Poe was known to have visited her here and courted her here in the stacks. In fact, we have a copy of the poem Ulalume that had been published in the American Whig Review anonymously and uh, the story is that they were meeting in Sarah Helen had pointed it out and said, oh, have you seen this poem, Ula Loom? And he said, why, Sarah, I wrote that for you. And so his signature is in pencil under that poem. 
our collections really re represent the reading interests of the populace at that time. And as a combination of perhaps the reluctance of our founding fathers and the librarians that continued to work here and didn't want to discard anything, we retain many of those collections. And so now those collections really re represent insights into a group of people that were trying to form a library at that time where their own civilization was really taking form. This place has witnessed um, uh, civil unrest, economic unrest, the American Revolution, weather travesties, and then still somehow has continued to um, keep its foothold. And today, um, we continue to be a circulating library, true to our mission, um, but also a very vibrant, active cultural center where we're an amplifier, if you will, of local arts and culture. We've really tried to uh, embrace that part of our mission by working with the city. Members of my staff, along with me, participated in the Creative Providence Plan. We also collaborate with over 100 organizations here in the city and have built those collaborations over the last six or seven years in a way that has helped put us more in the forefront of the activity of the community versus really the perception of an old historic library that is merely a repository of books on a dusty shelf, but more of an institution that is letting the past teach it to be relevant in the future.